Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is the new Dharma Central for uh, the new, new studio. Uh, I just moved, just made a big move. And so uh, here we are. I'm still getting a little settled, actually, with in terms of my whiteboard and all of that. So that'll, that'll take a second. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a new month. I'm in a new place. So we're starting a new sutra. Um, this is this is an intense sutra. I got to tell you. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna mess not gonna mess around. Uh, this is a serious sutra that we're about to start. I have no idea how long this will take us. I, I'm I'm feeling like this might be the fall semester. <laughs> Uh, it might be more than four or five sessions. Um, it might just take tonight just to introduce, just to introduce it, and all of all of this. It might not even be necessary. Um, so, like always, I'm gonna really go slowly. Yeah, because I go real slow. I'm gonna really ease us in into this sutra um, because we're starting a brand new sutra. We have no. We have no expectations, we have no agenda. And so at any point, if you wanna jump in, ask some questions or you know, voice some insights, please feel free. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna kind of slowly start to introduce this new sutra. Um, as, as most people know, this is the, the Dharma doors. And so we have at least for many, many months, if not longer, we have been exploring an anthology, a collection of sutras called the, the Maharatnakuta Sutra, the great heap of jewels. I often have the, the, uh, an image of the heap of jewels, the pile of gems that the Buddha sits on top of. Uh, I don't have that up tonight. Um, but this is the yellow book, right? The treasury of Mahayana Sutras. Uh, that we're exploring. And so if you have this book or you're familiar with this English translation of part of the Maharatnakuta Sutra, uh, we're going to be reading what they call Sutra number six. Yeah, that's helpful because this is actually Sutra number 46 of 49. So the whole Ratnakuta, the whole pile of, of jewels, is 49 sutras and this is number 46. So we're pretty deep in in the pile but I, I might have mentioned this to to you all at some point that the Ratnakuta, the, the anthology, it doesn't seem to be uh, linear. It's not like sutra number one is the more elementary stuff and sutra 46 doesn't actually seem to play out like that. Who knows, once we go through all of these, we might realize, wow, there is a logic to the progression. Um, but it, it, it does seem to be more of like a pile where it's like you just, you dive in and start rolling around. You don't even know which is first or second or third in that way. Uh, I think that's a helpful image to have in mind. This sutra though, this is a really interesting sutra. Um, Let's, let's just go ahead and get started. Let's just go ahead and get started. Um, like all of these sutras, even, even, even the name, you're like, well, what sutra are we doing tonight, Michael? It's a little tricky, as always, because these things have like, uh, well, uh, in the yellow book, it's called Manjushri's Discourse on the Paramita of Wisdom. Yep. The uh, Wen Shu Shuo Bo Rei Jing in Chinese, Manju Shri speaks Pranya Sutra. That's what the Chinese is. Um, indeed, Manju Shri, the Dharma Prince, star of, is the star of the sutra. Not only is he the star, but it's this is this is the Manju Shri speaks the Pranya Paramita Sutra. So this is like Manjushri's sutra on perfect wisdom, 
transcendent wisdom, great wisdom. It's this idea of prajna. Tonight, we're going to talk about this Buddhist idea of prajna, uh, what is usually translated as perfect wisdom or transcendent wisdom. This is Manjushri's discourse or his sutra on this whole idea, the whole idea of prajna. That's the sutra. But, you know, of all of the Ratnakuta, of all of the sutras in this collection, this is, this is a, this is a fun one because it's one of the rare, rare sutras of the Ratnakuta collection where we have the Sanskrit. We have the Sanskrit. And so there is a, a scholar of Buddhism, very big in the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, named Edward Konza. Uh, C-O-N-Z-E, uh, Edward Konza. He he kind of pioneered the the pioneered the translation pro the English translation project of sutras dealing with pranya, transcendent wisdom, perfect wisdom, and and um, well actually before I even introduce this Sanskrit version. We're going to take, we're, we're already digressing. We're already going back. So there is a very, very important, famous, well-known, well-respected sutra, teaching of the Buddha, called the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, sometimes just called the Vajra Sutra. And this word Vajra, right? This is the Vajra. The Vajra Sutra, this is sometimes, I, I, I don't know why, but it's sometimes called a diamond. Does, does this look like a diamond to you? I, this is the Vajra, the lightning bolt, thunderbolt weapon of Indra, god of the sky, right? This is the Vajra. And there is a very important, very well-known, very respected, sutra called the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. Um, because this is our first lesson or our first class in this sutra, I will take this moment to explain this. I, I can't, again, I can't um, say enough about how important this sutra is, the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. And if I were to put on my, my scholar's cap, right, and I, I mean, I've got glasses on, so I'm halfway there. But if I were to put on the, the, the accoutrement of the scholar and speak to you as a historian scholar, I would tell you that, you know, there's this large body of, of sutras, discourses of the Buddha, that are preserved in the, the Pali language that represent this very com almost archaic, arcane, original type of Buddhism. Yeah, and that's sort of the foundation of a lot of schools of Buddhism is just this original pile or heap of teachings of the Buddha, an original, original pile. Again, they're preserved in a language called Pali, Actually, they're kind of preserved in Sinhala, Sinhalese. But anyways, it's a really kind of original form of Buddhism. And as everybody in the, definitely in this classroom knows, and if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know, we're dealing primarily with a slightly later form of Buddhism, this Mahayana, Mahayana, uh, Bodhisattva type of Buddhism, uh, often called the second turning of the wheel. And that, or, that original pile I just spoke of is sometimes called the first turning of the wheel of the law or wheel of the Dharma, right? But the idea is, is that if you're a historian, scholar, and you're interested in like time, history, sequence, cr chronology, if you're interested in those things, you, you may want to know that it appears to the scholar 
that there was this original form of Buddhism and there kind of appears to have been one, one, one really miraculous sutra from that period. And we, we now know it as the Vajrapanyaparamita Sutra, the Vajra Sutra, or the Diamond Sutra. What I mean to say is, is that the Vajra or Diamond Sutra does appear to be like a cusp sutra, like kind of very in between the old school uh, Theravada Pali based tradition and the more Sanskrit Mahayana based tradition. And by the way, if for some unknown reason, this is your first time ever hearing this, everything I'm talking about is way BC. It's way BC, super BC, like two, at least 2000 years ago. So don't, don't think that this Mahayana, Mahayana Bodhisattva path is like from the, from the like 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that. No, no. This is still a very old type of Buddhism. And in fact, there's a way that you shouldn't even distinguish old school from new school, but whatever. The idea is if you're already familiar with that little vehicle, big vehicle, if you're already familiar with that distinction, the Vajra Sutra, the, the, the Sutra in which the Buddha seemingly sort of really breaks down this idea of prana, transcendent or super wisdom, super wisdom, right? That Vajra Sutra seems to have begin that seems to be the beginning of a whole world of ideas. And what I mean to say is, is that this guy, Edward Konza, kind of dedicated his scholarly life to translating any sutra that had to do with prana, transcendent wisdom, because this was a new idea. Um, this, he, this guy, look at, check, look at this guy, right? He's, he's an interesting looking guy, right? But he was like a philosopher. He was very interested in these ideas. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if he ever did Zazen. I don't know if he ever did any seated meditation, but he was very interested in these ideas. And the, what happened was, is that he, Edward Konza, he, he, he put together a, um, well, there's this book, also by the same Edward Konza. This book, which you might think, oh, that's very thin. This is actually a, just a bibliography. So this is just the titles, just the names of all the different sutras deal, that deal with this idea of wisdom, Buddhist wisdom, transcendent, perfect wisdom. So this is just a bibliography of just the names of them all. And Unlike, unlike a lot of our other sutras, even the Vajra Sutra that has this like cool name, many of the, the Pranya Sutras, the sutras that deal with transcendent wisdom, they don't have cool names. I'm sorry, they don't, they don't have cool names. They're just Pranya Sutras, sutras about wisdom, but they are, are the names of them are the, the length of them? Allow me to explain. By the way, if I, you know, if I didn't mention this already, all, the, all these sutras, all these things that we deal with on Sunday nights, all of these teachings, you know they're all in po poetic verse, right? <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. You, you might not have known this, but they are all in, they're all poems. In addition to being very profound ideas, teachings and lessons for life, they also happen to be poetry. And they are in lines 
not unlike Shakespeare. Like, you know, you probably went to the same high school I went to. You learned about iambic pentameter. You probably don't know what iambic pentameter is. I don't know what iambic pentameter is. But we know that there is this fixed form of poetic verse that Shakespeare like wrote. He wrote all of his, his poem or his plays in a certain fixed form of verse called iambic pentameter, right? Well, it just so happens that the Buddha or the Buddhists spoke or wrote all of their teachings in a fixed form. <laughs> it's not iambic pentameter, it's actually these lines of 32 syllables. So it's kind of like a haiku. If you're familiar with haiku, these like that are in certain uh, numbers of syllables or actually characters. So it's about the, the number. All of most of these sutras are in 32 syllable lines. And that 32 syllable line is called a shloka. And so you get sutras that don't have names. They have like the Pranya Sutra in 500 shlokas. The, the, pran, the Sutra about Pranya in 700 shlokas. The Sutra about Pranya in 25,000 shlokas. Lines of metered verse, right? And by the way, this goes all the way up to this giant volume, also translated by, you guessed it, Edward Konza. This is the 25,000 shloka. This is a, this is a talk about a tome. So this is about as, as, as big as these sutras get, the Pranya sutras. There's this one too in 8,000 lines. This is sort of considered the masterpiece. If you're really into Pranya Sutras, you should check out the 8,000 line version. Also translated by, you guessed it, Edward Konza. So of this world of Pranya Sutras that measure from 25,000 lines to 8,000 lines, by the way, the Vajra or Diamond Sutra is the Pranyaparamita Sutra in 500 shlokas. So it's called the Vajra Sutra, but it's also called the Pranyaparamita Sutra in 500 lines. Just so you know, this, this uh, world of Pranya Sutras keeps shrinking, keeps shrinking, keeps shrinking down actually to the Pranyaparamita Sutra in just 14, 14 little lines. That's called the Heart Sutra. If you've heard of the Heart Sutra, that's considered the heart of the teachings of Pranya because it's so succinct, so concise, just 14 little lines, right? I'm not gonna go too far on all of this, but I'm gonna now back up to let you know that what we're reading, what we're starting tonight, I don't even know if we're gonna read this, but what, what we're starting tonight is called the Sapta Shatika or Shatika, Sapta Shatika Pranyaparamita Sutra. Say that three times fast, right? But this is the 700 line versions of the Pranyaparamita Sutra. A little longer than the Vajra Sutra, a little longer than the Diamond Sutra. Again, what's really wonderful about this is that Edward Konza, Edward Konza, in this uh, perfect wisdom, the short Pranyaparamita Sutras. So this is a great collection translated by Edward Konza. And this has the Vajra Sutra in 500 lines. It has the one that we're starting tonight in 700 lines. There is a English translation from the Sanskrit, from a Sanskrit version. This is exciting. This is very exciting. I, I know that you're as excited as I am. You've been coming, 
you know that often we only have the Chinese and we're frustrated because we just, it's like, oh, if only we knew, if only we knew what Sanskrit word, if only we knew. Well, Edward Konza has our back on the Sanskrit. And so what's great is we're gonna do a little back and forth this month or however long this takes, dealing with that. Um, I, I think that might be it. That's the title. In Chinese, it's called Manjushri's Pranyaparamita Sutra. And in Sanskrit, it's just called the Sata Shatika Pranyaparamita Sutra or the Pranyaparamita Sutra in 700 lines or otherwise known as the Discourse of the Buddha, the Sutra on Perfect Wisdom in 700 lines. Questions about the title of this sutra. Are there any other Pranibharasmi sutras in the Ratnakuta collection? It's, uh, that's a great question. No, that's a great question. There are other sutras. Mm, this that's a very tricky question to answer because these groupings these groupings of like uh say edward konza's pranyaparamita sutra all the titles of them you know this isn't this isn't like an official list so what i mean to say to answer that question quickly in the Ratnakuta collection, there are other sutras that certainly touch on the subject of prana. This is probably the, I think this is the only one though that kind of falls into that world of like technically prana sutras. So I've, uh, you know, and, and I have pointed out many, um, I've pointed out many references to the Vajra Sutra in here. Pretty much every sutra that we've done, I've been like, oh, by the way, that's a Vajra Sutra reference. And, and in many ways, all of Mahayana Buddhism is a reference to the Vajra Sutra, frankly. But in terms of the technical world of Pranya Sutras, yeah, this is going to be our only one. That's that. Okay, so that's the title. Everybody else good? By the way, I hope everybody is doing well, isn't too hot. I know it's a little crazy out there. So let's let's cool out with some nice cool dharma. Yeah. Um there's a there's so much I have to say about each aspect of this from from the players to like everything, everything. And so as long as everybody in the Zoom room is on board with like, oh, okay, prana, a Pranya Sutra, great. Let's, let's get into it. Let's get into it, right? So here we go. Um, thus have I heard, right? Once the Buddha was dwelling in the garden of Anathapindika, in the Jetta Grove near Shravasti, accompanied by 1,000 great monks. Also present in the assembly were 10,000 bodhisattva mahasattvas, all of whom had adorned themselves with great merits and were abiding in the stage of non-regression. Among the great bodhisattvas were Bodhisattva Maitreya, the future Buddha, Bodhisattva Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma, uh, Bodhisattva Unhindered Eloquence, and Bodhisattva Never Abandoning Vows. <laughs> One day at dawn, Bodhisattva Mahasattva Manjushri, came from his lodging to the Buddha's dwelling place and stood outside the door. 
the Venerable Shariputra, the Venerable Purna Maitreya Yaneputra, the Venerable Maha Madhuryayana, Venerable Maha Kashapya, Venerable Maha Katyayana, Venerable Maha Kastila, and other great Shravakas, voice hearers, also came from their respective lodgings to the Buddha's dwelling place and stood outside the door. When the Buddha knew that the entire assembly had gathered, he came out of his dwelling place, arranged his seat, and sat down. Then he asked Shariputra, why do you stand outside the door at this early hour? Shariputra replied to the Buddha, world honored one. It was Bodhisattva Manjushri who came and stood outside the door first. I came later. Then the World Honored One asked Manjushri, did you really come here first in order to see the Tathagata? Manjushri replied to the Buddha, Yes, World Honored One, I did come here to see the Tathagata. Why? Because I wish to benefit sentient beings with right contemplation. We're going to stop there. <laughs> Just to make sure all of the mysteries are clear, right? So, I know, I know everybody here knows that these, these Ratnakuta Sutras and Mahayana Sutras, we know that these are not historical documents about historical events. <laughs> but everybody knows that I teach these allegorically. It's much funner, it's much more insightful, if you're not looking at this as, or I should say, if you're not looking at this just as, just as an event regarding the Buddha, Shariputra, and Manjushri. And this whole Manjushri goes to wait at the Buddha's dwelling place, the Buddha comes out, and that quick exchange of Shariputra, like, I didn't, it was meant, it wasn't me, it was him. There's a way that you could just read that as a simple, like, like that th these are who were there and now let's go. But of course, if, you're, if, you, if you know the allegorical thing that's going on here, you know, of course, that Shariputra represents the Shravaka, the original old school type of Buddhism that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Manjushri, represents the Mahayana, the great vehicle, the Bodhisattva path. And if by any chance you were here for the Vimalakirti experience, <laughs> if you, or you are familiar with the great Vimalakirti Sutra, and you know about this great Bodhisattva Vimalakirti and his house of emptiness, if you know that Vimalakirti lives in a house of emptiness. And if you were to go over to Vimalakirti's house for tea, you might wonder where the chairs and tables and even where the tea is, right? <laughs> because he lives in a house of emptiness. That's kind of, if you know the Vimalakirti Sutra, that is sort of helpful in terms of this allegorical way of understanding sutras, that when they talk about the Buddha, being in his dwelling place and then there's a door and he comes out of the door and is like why are you outside the door why don't you come in the door why don't you come through the doorway through the dharma door right the idea is is that this isn't the buddha's like meditation shack and everybody's waiting outside the meditation shack. It's that the Buddha abides in a 
in a, uh, you know, <laughs> a vast palace, a vast palace of, of emptiness. And there's a way in which you should consider that in, in terms of the language, doorways, dwelling places, all, all of this has deep, deep significance and meaning from a meditative point of view. Okay. So I just want you to kind of think about that. I'm not even going to like uh, push upon you any particular meaning that I, or at least that I haven't already. Um, but just for you to think about that. So that, you know, it's all kind of maybe allegorical. And that from the get go, from the jump, we have three players, the Buddha, a bodhisattva, and a, a monk, a renunciant. How about a seeker? How about a novice? How about you? <laughs> kind of an idea. So Shariputra kind of always represents the learner in that sense. So I just want you to kind of kind of keep that. Um, uh, well, I, I, I actually, I like to call it a, a, it's a trilectical argument or a trilectical conversation, not a dia, not a dialectical argument. Everybody in the West is crazy about dialectics. How about trialectics? How about three, like three elements? How about that, Plato? Right? So I just want you to know that these are going to be the three elements of the trialectical uh, discourse, a trilectical discourse. And yeah, and of course, hey, man, it's somebody has it? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, Eric. There's a lot of echoes, but Happens. anyways. Uh, yeah, I, I really like your comment regarding seeing uh, Shariputra as the learner. And I wonder if that's why he never gets the Maha before his name. <laughs> because he, we have Maha Kashapa. Many Shravakas have already earned their Maha. Um, I, I like your thinking. And I never, I never like to, to burst bubbles. But I need to share with you that as far as I know, the reason why he's Maha Madhuryayana and Maha Kashapya is because actually there's another monk named Kashapya. Ah. And there's another monk named Maguyayana. And so that you don't think we're talking about that other one, we're talking about Maha Maguyayana. Mm. Uh, maybe there wasn't another Shariputra, and so they didn't need to distinguish. But I like I like what you're thinking. And to add to add to that. You, you may notice that Shariputra uh, pops up in a lot of these sutras, uh, the Ratnakuta sutras. He pops up in a lot of these Mahayana sutras, but he often plays the fool. He often plays the, the, the foil, if you will, in that sense. And the, I, in the Vimalakirti experience, I offered a few insights in, into like why, why that might be. Why, why Shariputra? Why does Shariputra keep getting picked on? Right? Because he, he kind of gets picked on a lot. And it seems that if you want to know why Shariputra or if you're, if, you know, my thinking about that is that if you look back into that original Pali, Sutra canon, the original old school sutras, you find that there is one of the Shravakas, one of the Arhats, one of the early followers of the Buddha. You find one of them that, well, that often has sutras of his own, and that's Shariputra. Shariputra seems to have, and I, I don't want to like, um, I don't want to say anything wrong here, but he seems to have either been um, uh, uh, granted by the Buddha, like, okay, it's okay, you can go teach the Dharma too, or he just, at certain point in his arhatship, he reached that level where he could deliver the teachings. 
And so Shariputra has a lot of sutras of his own where he's the person that delivers the discourse, not the Buddha, it's Shariputra. And so Shariputra's interesting role as a, well, he's not a stand-in for the Buddha, but he is a, a spokesperson for the Buddha. That idea of speaking on behalf of the Dharma, let's say, let's not even say the Buddha, but speaking on behalf of the Dharma, it seems to have been a position of Shariputra. And so a lot of these Mahayana sutras from the way that I read them are kind of like, hey, hey, Shariputra, since you're, you know, you're so big about teaching people the Dharma, why don't you teach them this? Why don't you teach them this? So it's maybe one of the reasons why Shariputra appears in these sutras is because he represents, and, and again, this is the allegorical reading, that he sort of represents that speaking on behalf of the Buddha, of course, of which all of this is going to be. Magistri is going to be speaking on behalf of the Buddha and all that. So, okay. Okay, um, so that's our introduction. It's a pretty simple whiteboard tonight as far as, you know, at least for part one or the beginning of this. There's not a lot of action. This is a dialogue. So I really just wanted to make the three players clear. Um, yeah. And again, just lay out that kind of allegorical intro. If, if, unless there's any other questions, we are about to get into the teachings. This is, um, well, yeah, this, the paragraph I'm about to, Trialogue, trialogue. So I'm about to get into what is arguably, sorry about all the shaking, arguably this is the densest, heaviest paragraph of the sutra. I don't think we'll get much further than this tonight. Let's see how it goes. So this is all part of the Buddha being like, yo, man, Jushri, like, what are you doing? What are you doing standing outside my door, right? Manjushri replies, yeah, we're all on one. I did come here to see the Tathagata, the Tathagata. Uh, and by the way, if you, you're not familiar with that word Tathagata, just quickly, it is one of the various titles of the Buddha, world honored one, Buddha, Tathagata, tamer of gods and men. He, like the, the, a fully enlightened being has many titles of which Tathagata is one. But that's about to get very complicated. So Manjushri replies that yes, he came to see the Buddha, but he came to see the Tathagata. And why? Because Manjushri wishes to benefit sentient beings with right contemplation. And even before I proceed any further, I got to let you know, that idea of right contemplation, that's a reference to the Noble Eightfold Path. It's a reference to Samyak, uh, Samyak Smriti, Samya Sati right mindfulness, that's um, probably seventh step in the Eightfold Path of having right mindfulness. So again, there's a way of looking at a sutra like this, that this is just good old fashioned Buddhism, good old fashioned right contemplation. But this is Manjushri's version of right contemplation. How is, how, what, is, what does Manjushri mean by that? Well, he says, I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by 
suchness by non-distinction, by immobility, by non-action, by neither arising nor ceasing, by neither existing nor not existing, by being located neither in some place nor elsewhere, by being neither in the three phases of time, past, present, and future, nor otherwise, by being neither dualistic nor non-dualistic, and by having neither purity nor impurity. I benefit sentient beings with such right contemplation of the Tathagata. Okay, so that's what we're here to talk about. If you've been coming to the Dharma Doors and you've been following the Ratnakuta Sutra, this shouldn't sound unfamiliar to you, which is this idea of how to properly or correctly, how to correctly see the Buddha, but not the Buddha per se, but how to correctly see the Tathagata. Right? Again, this is a theme in these sutras, which is how to properly or correctly see the Tathagata. We're going to take a few uh, minutes just to break down this word Tathagata. It, this is a situation where the Sanskrit and to a certain degree, frankly, even the Chinese are, are way, uh, they're way more helpful than the English. And what I mean by that is, is that Manjushri's very, very first, the very first thing he says, I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by suchness. The word suchness is tapata, which is etymologically and philosophically extremely related to tathagata. In fact, they're almost the same word with just a slight, a slight difference. So it's interesting because what Manjushri really says is that I contemplate the tathagata as characterized by tathata. And so again, it's like, oh, in Sanskrit, you see the word play. And again, even in the Chinese, there is the same word play. In English, you don't get the word play because Tathagata and suchness have nothing to do with each other etymologically in terms of English. So let's break this down really quick. You've probably heard this word, Tathagata, Tathagata, and you might have heard it translated as thus come one or thus gone one thus come one or thus gone the word can as far as i understand can be pronounced either tathagata or tathagata and thus it changes slightly whether it's thus come or thus gone it doesn't actually matter per se regarding tathagata or tathagata because the really important part of it is the tatha, the, the suchness, the, the suchness part of this. So in Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, there's this beautiful idea of tathata, suchness. It could also be translated as thus, thusness. And it's a very, very profound idea. More or less, this sutra is designed to bring us to a better understanding of suchness or tathata. So I'm only going to give this the most requisite, you know, kind of introduction because the sutra is here to teach us the rest. But you should know that there's this word tathata and well, it's kind of, 
I mean, it has such deep, profound meaning. I sometimes like to translate it as, as it is-ness, like, as it is. But what the word kind of refers to, and again, I don't want to spend kind of all night on this, but it's about, it's about extreme presence. I'm talking about being so present in, in this, present, present, so, so, so present that, well, if you were to get so presently aware, if you were to get so presently aware that yesterday, this morning, even an hour ago, even the, even the, a few minutes, a uh, half hour ago when this started, if you were to forget all about the past entirely, like just be here, like the be here now, right? The famous book, right? Be here now. So the past is, again, not even when I started this sentence, forget about it, just be present. And so if we were extremely present with no past, and if we had no expectations of the future, no, not even in a conception of the future, we're not, it's like so present that there's no past, no future. And if you were so deep, so deep in, in it, that there was no past or no future, there would be no present even, even that, because the present is relative to the past and the future. So if you were to read just like here now, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm running out of words to bring you into just pure, if you were really just present, that would be approaching things just, hello, Thus, such, suchness, this, this absolute present with no reference or relativity to the past, future, and therefore not even relative to time. Let's even forget about the idea of here. Let's even forget about the idea of here versus there. Let's, if you were to sink that deep into being, that would be approaching tatata, this sort of just suchness. It's difficult to really get there because our minds tend to remain temporally based for a whole bunch of different reasons. But the idea is that we're trying to, to touch just the thus the such. That's sort of getting, again, it's pointing at, it's getting towards tathata. Now, in Sanskrit, if we were to, um, the, the word agata, so not tathata, but tath agata. In Sanskrit, what tath agata, so for actually forget about the, the thus come, thus gone. What the word tath agata seems to mean is emerging or arising out of tathata, that which has emerged out of thusness. That's a way of talking about the Buddha. The, the, the one, the one that emerges out of pre pure presence, pure tathata, has no relationship to the past, no relationship to the future, not even a relationship to present space-time awareness. It's like beyond, beyond. That is sort of the idea of this tathagata. Tathata. Tathagata. I, I go through all of that, the, that kind of linguistic gymnastics there. I go through all of that because 
what they're talking about is how to see that. If you read this and you think that they're talking about how to see the Buddha, yeah, yeah, they're talking about how to see the Buddha, but they're kind of actually talking about how, how to see pure thusness. That's kind of like, whoa, I, I, how, do, how do you see pure thusness? How do you see that which has no relationship to the past and future? How do you see that which has no relationship to space and time? How do you see that, right? Or how do you contemplate that? How do you even conceive of or think of that which is beyond conceptualization? That is what we're interested in. Not, not uh, like, you know, how, how do you know what an enlightened person looks like? Do they have a... Do they have light coming out of their forehead or do they have like, like it's like we're not talking about the physical, uh, how to recognize an enlightened being. We're talking about how do you touch this profound idea of pure presence? <clears throat> Questions, answers, ideas before we start finding out about that. Okay. So Manjushri says, oh, well, I, I contemplate the Tathagata, the thus come one, that which has emerged from suchness. I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by Tathata. We're, we're still there. We're still in the first part of the first sentence. Manjushri says, I think about, I consider, I contemplate the Tathagata as characterized by Tathata, by suchness. And there's a few others by non-distinction, by immobility, by non-action. There's a way in which this English translation, eh, you know, I'm always, I always have my problems with this translation and this is going to be one of those situations. Um, phil philosophically, or I just, I should say dharmically speaking, there's something very interesting going on in this paragraph that if you have a Chinese version is very clear. And it's in this word characterized, characterized. What that word characterized, so I consider the Buddha, I consider the Tathagata as characterized by this wild idea of suchness, pure presence, presence that's not even relative to past and future. I, I characterize the Tathagata by that and by non-distinction, immobility, all these other things. The word, a very important word there is the characterized that, well, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, again, the way this is translated. There's a word in the Sanskrit version and in the Chinese version, in both of those, there's a word that keeps getting repeated. And it's the word uh, lakshana. Lakshana, lakshana. In Chinese, it's this uh, really interesting character, xiang. Um, the xiang is a, is a and a, a shyam is a lakshana, and this is the word in Buddhism that gets translated as usually a, a sign, mark, 
two of the most useless translations of this word because people have a lot of different ideas about those words mark and sign. But the word lakshana, and it's also what the Chinese xiang mean, it's this idea of a, of a characteristic, a quality, an attribute. It's, it, and I know that a lot of people in the Zoom classroom, you, everybody knows about lakshana, qualities or characteristics, but just for posterity's sake, the sake of this Dharma talk, it's important to make very clear that what they're talking about with uh, the Chinese, with this xiang and the lakshana or lakshana, they're talking about not just visual qualities like uh, rectangular, white, flat. These are visual phenomena. And what, th what these visual lakshana, these qualities or characteristics, what they, you know, it's a very, very subtle philosophical idea, but it's this idea that what something is, let's say a whiteboard, right? My, my whiteboard, what something is, how I know what it is, how I would communicate to you what it is, how I know what things are or are not is based on their qualities, their characteristics, their attributes. So this thing is rectangular. That's an attribute, a quality. It's white. That's an attribute. That's a quality. That's a lakshana. It is, um, it, it has a quality where it can, um, uh, hold, uh, it doesn't absorb, of course. Fortunately, it doesn't have the quality of absorption. It's not a sponge. If it were a sponge, it would not make a very good whiteboard. In fact, I would know that it's a sponge because it would have different lakshana. Sponges soak ink and liquids up. They're sometimes rectangular, they could be white. So they could have qualities or characteristics similar to my whiteboard, but it would a sponge would be missing that key quality, that key characteristic, which is that this thing can hold ink or hold whatever this stuff is, the whiteboard stuff. And that's what makes it a whiteboard, that it, that it can do that, that it has that quality or characteristic. There's a bunch of other stuff that's rectangular, flat, and even white that might not be able to do that. And I wouldn't call that a whiteboard. <laughs> so the name, the name of something, what something is, is its qualities and characteristics, otherwise known as lakshana. This is a very subtle idea that I, I, I have to tell you if, if you, if you haven't studied a lot of philosophy formally, like Plato, Aristotle and stuff, this is what Plato and Aristotle are talking about. They're interested in this idea of like qualities of things and that it's these qualities that make something what it is and therefore it has that name, but there's a really kind of like well, there's just a very profound philosophical thing going on there in terms of like, um, well, you know, from a Buddhist point of view of seeing things, you know, like, oh, look, how, how do you know? How do you know what this is? And I, and I don't mean, you know, the specific, I mean, like, is it a hammer? Would this make a good hammer? Probably not, because it, it, it's lacking a few of those qualities or characteristics. So it's maybe not a hammer. Is it a cat? 
It's definitely lacking the characteristics of a cat. It's not moving by itself. It's not making any noise. It's not furry. So it's definitely not a cat. How do I know what this is? Well, you know what it is because of its lakshana. That you, you recognize it's so weird. Once you really start thinking about this, it's actually very weird in terms of like, wow, how did, how did I know that was a book? How did I know it was a book? Well, it had the, had the characteristics and qualities that you are very used to. And that when you see these characteristics, especially ooh, when you see those characteristics, book it's a book like there's nothing that is really else quite like that right so is everybody comfortable with this idea now lot i mean i know again everybody else here was but this idea of a these are lakshana these are characteristics and what make michael michael are the characteristics and qualities of michael this this this, all of this, and just to make this very clear and even more profound, laksh lakshana are not just visual. They're not just, I've been using visual because unfortunately we're in Zoom land and I, you know, visuals, <laughs> visuals the one I got. But of course, if you recognize my voice, it's because you recognize the quality or characteristics of my of this voice. They're not like the voice of your spouse or your partner or your parents or your dog or your cat. It this is the unique characteristics and qualities that then you're like, oh, that's Michael. I hear I hear him. There he is. Or if you were to see, uh, you know, how you can really uh, oddly, almost, um, almost magically, actually, the way you can recognize somebody that you know from so far away, just on because of their gait, as we call it, right? Their gait, the way they hold themselves, the way they walk. And you're like, oh, I, I know that. Like, even though they're so far away, well, that's because you recognize that characteristic or quality. So auditory, visual, if you get a, a whiff of something and you're like, oh wow, pancakes, it's because it's the olfactory lakshana of pancakes. Okay. My, Michael, what I think, um, Connie here, um, what I think is so interesting is that um, um, just to, to, to ponder about that talking about lakshanas, we kind of agree on lakshanas, right? But it's nothing um, obviously solid and finite. So um, yeah, it's something symbol symbolic symbolically. And uh, yeah, we it's basically an agreement among us, you know, which is interesting, yeah. You know, Connie, when I, when I say, are there any questions, comments, or insights, that's exactly what, that's a great insight. Exactly. You're, wow, that's really insightful. Like, if you really start looking under the hood at these lakshana, you realize, oh, there's a, it's kind of a language, it's an aspect of language almost in that conventional sense that Connie mentions where it's an agreement that, of these things. So hold, definitely hold on to that idea, Connie, as usual, you're way, way ahead of the sutra, but that's always great. So I, I needed to say all of that because what this discourse is, is all about in terms of how do I contemplate or in the, in the beginning of the sutra and in other sutras, it's this question of how do I, how do I see the Tathagata? How do I think of or contemplate the Tathagata? What's going on underneath that 
question of how to see or contemplate the Tathagata, it's what Lakshana, what Lakshana do I use to, to know I'm looking at the Tathagata and not a book or a cat? How do I know it's the Tathagata, the Buddha? And then in terms of contemplation, how do I know that I'm contemplating the Buddha and not a cat? Like what are the qualities, characteristics, attributes, signs, or marks? What are the Lakshana of Tathagata? Because if I had those, right, I would know, and then I could like sit there and, and meditate on the Lakshana of the Buddha or Lakshana of the Tathagata, right? But I, Michael, I don't really understand this conclusion because, you know, when we think about, um, you know, strawberry, you know, like the fruit, and we talk about the qualities. So now I ask you, what are your, what do you think is the quality of a, a strawberry? And you would say, oh, it's like sweet and it's red. And I'm like, well, for me, like normal, like I've just eaten strawberries that are a little bit sour. And the, where I come from, they are not really red, they are more white. So I don't really understand to how we try to agree on the Dathagata with finding the, the qualities. Um, mm. You know, like kind of. But that's a, that's a great question, Connie, because I mean, just to put it, everybody loves it when I just put it bluntly. So to put it bluntly, if you want to see or contemplate the Tathagata, you would definitely not be relying on any Lakshana. Right. That's that's for sure. So again, you're you're a step ahead of it in that sense that it's like what Manjushri is going to tell us is that if you want to see or contemplate the Tathagata, you better not be using Lakshana because they're as illusory and tricksy as Connie is talking about. That's why you should not rely on Lakshana to see the Tathagata because of what Connie's talking about. Mm. Just to put it bluntly, because that's where Connie's at, that's the idea, Connie. So you're you're right there. You're right there. I don't Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. It's for everybody else that might still be holding on to Lakshana a little bit that we need to go through all this. Okay, so the first part of, now, now we can get back to Manjushri's first thing he said. I contemplate the Tathagata as having the Lakshana of Tathata. And I know that that might sound like it's, it's kind of not what I just said, in terms of you, if you want to see the Tathagata, don't use characteristics. But Manjushri, Manjushri just said the Tathagata has the characteristic of Tathata. Manjushri is just kind of being cute. Or, or, I mean, he's just, he, he's Manjushri. So hold on to that um, if, you were, if you were thinking that. But I want you to know that he's playing, Manjushri that is, is playing with this idea of Lakshana. Because, and what he's saying, and this is what I mean by the Sanskrit and the Chinese, both the Sanskrit and the Chinese, they keep using this word Lakshana. Uh, I contemplate the Tathagata as having the characteristic of suchness, by having the characteristic of non distinction, by having the characteristic of immobility, by having the characteristic of no action. So Manjushri is actually speaking about the qualities or Lakshana of the Tathagata, but he's doing it in this really, you know, wise way, which is, well, let's just take that second one. So the first one is, I contemplate the Tathagata as having the Lakshana of suchness. So, and by the way, when I went off about suchness or tathata is this extreme 
presence that has no relationship to the past, no relationship to the future. In fact, it's so non-relational to time and space that it's, it's not related to anything. That's Tathata. Yeah, the Tathagata has the characteristics of not being related to anything. It, it gets tricky, it gets tricky. But I just want you to know that's sort of a, an interpretation of the first one. The Tathagata has the characteristic of suchness. The Tathagata has the characteristic of non-distinction. So remember when I was talking about my cat? Remember when I was talking about is it a book or is it a cat? That's called a, a, a distinction. That's called making a distinction between what I think of as a book and what I think of as a cat and what I think is a whiteboard and what I think is a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. That's all distinguishing. What it, you know, this word distinction, you could also substitute discrimination to discriminate this from that, to discriminate me from you, to discriminate the cat from the dog, to discriminate the good dog from the bad dog, to do all of these discriminations. Manjushri contemplates the Tathagata as having the Lakshana or characteristic of being indistinguishable. I don't actually know how to do that. I don't actually know how to not distinguish. I'm working on it. It's part of my dharma. It's part of my practice. It's, it's where I'm like, oh, that sounds like a deep, a, a deep practice to try to arrive at a state of not distinguishing here from there, this from that, me from you, anything from anything else, not distinguishing. If you understood my Lakshana spiel and that it Lakshana are how we distinguish this from that, how do I know it's a book and not a cat based on Lakshana? So dis dis discernment, distinguishment, discriminant, discriminating requires some characteristics or qualities to go on. Do you want it or do you not want it? Well, I need to know a little about it. Is it, is it yummy or is it nasty? I, I want yummy, I don't want nasty. So tell me the lakshana, tell me the characteristics so that I can discriminate, so that I can start choosing. Apparently, Magistri just said that the Buddha is, or Tathagata, is beyond distinction. Hmm. <laughs> huh. No, no wonder this is right contemplation. No wonder this is a discourse on right or correct contemplation. How do you contemplate the indistinguishable? I don't know. Manjushri will probably help us get there though. Everybody good with that, just that idea of not distinguishing and the profound paradox of how that might occur? Oh, right. Manjushri says he also contemplates the Tathagata as characterized by, as having the characteristic of immobility. No, not Im immobile. This is very mobile, right? I'm, I'm very mobile. I just moved houses. All this, all this moved. It's all mobile. Everything, the, the wind, the air, uh, everything is mobile. Everything has mobility. 
Manjushri just said he contemplates the Tathagata as having the characteristic of immobility. I can pretend, I can pretend to contemplate immobility. I don't think I'm actually contemplating immobility, but I can pretend. Like I can like imagine something just being still and, and like pretend that I'm contemplating immobility, but I know that that's not actual immobility. Questions, comments, insights on immobility. Everybody, everybody get that? How, like, what would that mean, immobile? <laughs> Everything seems movable, right? And, and just in case you're like, like, what's going on here? What's happening here? This is, again, just Manjushri answering the Buddha. When the Buddha said, how do you how do you how do you contemplate the Tathagata? Manjushri is like, oh, that's having the characteristics of suchness, non-distinction, immobility, you know. So he's just laying out how he contemplates Tathagata. The answer, like, there there's more to this. So again, this is just the grand introduction to a bunch of the ideas that Tathagata is characterized as thus indistinguishable, immovable, immovable or immobile. And Manjushri says that he contemplates the Tathagata as having the characteristic of non-action. Non-action. <laughs> this is action, by the way, but you probably want to know, I know that you want to know, that this word action is also in Sanskrit called karma. Karma is action, action of the body, action of the mouth, and action of the mind. That's action, activity, which is also a, a movement, right? Manjushri, though, says that he contemplates the Tathagata as having the characteristic of non-karma, non-action. So there's no movement, there's no activity of the body, speech, or mind. In, in fact, you can't even distinguish the, the Tathagata from not the Tathagata. And that should make sense because the Tathagata was characterized by Tathata. And this is Tathata. Suchness, as it isness. It, it, in fact, Tathata, it, it's like everywhere you look. Frankly, it, it's like everywhere. That's Tathata. Behold. Behold, right? Ecce homo, behold, man. This is the idea, right? So that's Tathagata. And if the Tathagata is indistinguishable without any movement, no action. Wow. Wow. Everybody ready to keep going? Again, again, this is just laying the this is laying the groundwork here. Manjushri says he also contemplates or sees or thinks of the Buddha, Tathagata, as characterized by neither arising nor ceasing. Not coming into being and not going out of being, right? There Remember my cat book? Remember my book, right? There was a day, there was a time that this did not exist. 
before City Lights. This is the City Lights, San Francisco City Lights edition. So before uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and before the gang got together and started City Lights books and before all of that, this didn't exist. It came into being, it currently exists, and it will someday fall apart, decay, and cease to be. So the book arises and ceases, feelings or emotions arise, but then they cease. This unbearable heat, this unbearable heat will ar is ar has, has arisen, but fortunately it will not last and it will cease. In fact, the great, the great teaching of the Buddha is that all these things arise and cease. That's the nature of everything. This is the law, this is, this is the law. Everything arises and ceases. But Manjushri just said that he contemplates the Tathagata as neither arising nor ceasing. I, I tend to do this thing where I, I, I go off for a while on like tapata, suchness, being not relative to past and future. I do this to plant seeds so that this would sound perfect, this would make perfect sense to you, right? Neither arising nor ceasing. Well, that sounds like before, during, and after. Before, no book. Book, no book. That's all past, present, future stuff. I told you, Tathata has nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with the past. The past is gone. It's gone. The only thing about yesterday is, a, is this, is this uh, memory maybe, right? It's gone though. It's not, it's not here anymore. Tomorrow is not here. Tathata, tathata. So presence, thusness, this is tathata. And so Manjushri says that he contemplates the tathagata as not coming from anywhere and not going anywhere, neither arising nor ceasing. This, this is true of all of these. I don't know how to think of that. Again, I can pretend, but and, and the only reason I say that is, is that if, if, if you're sitting there scratching your head like, wait, what? You're, that, you're like, you're in the right place. <laughs> if you're sitting there thinking like, I got this, then you're in the wrong place. If this is too easy for you, then you're probably thinking about the wrong place. This is like really some deep ideas in that sense, right? But I want you, or at least what I'm trying to communicate, is how they're all very related. The idea of neither arising nor ceasing and suchness and no mobility, not moving from here to there. They're all related in this sense. And they're all similar in that they require... They require a certain mindset. Let me just call it a mindset for now. They all require a certain mindset in order to contemplate, or as I say, touch them. They all require the same one. And, and what that is, is a mindset that is sort of backing away from Lakshanic distinction. Me from you, here from there, whiteboard from the book. All of those are distinctions based on Lakshana. And if the mind were to kind of cease doing that, not trying to find the Buddha over here, or the Buddha over there, the Tathagata down here, but actually the mindset that actually is like almost letting go of Lakshanic distinction making. All of these require that same mindset. And I would be, I, I would like to make the bold step and suggest that that mindset that I'm suggesting is called pranya. 
this, the, the theme of these sutras, this transcendent wisdom, the wisdom that can contemplate the Tathagata properly, correctly, that wisdom is called pranya, and it is a wisdom or a discern, I mean, I don't even want to call it a discernment. I don't want to call it a discriminant, but it is a, a mindset that does not distinguish this from that, does not distinguish white or light from dark and all of that. It's non-distinguishing. So they all have that same uh, mode or mindset, as we'll call it for now. Michael, what I think, and just a small, uh, tiny comment, what, what I think strikes me a little bit like the, the word, word uh, expression of contemplation, because contemplation is um, um, thought-based, right? And, and thinking is always con conditioned, and the Dathagaka and, and what you're talking about, or the Sutta is talking about, is everything that is before if there is time you know obviously there's no linear of time but it before okay there's no time but before a thought <laughs> even arises so can a thought and conditioning and a, a consideration and contemplation know its own source because everything you know so you know what i'm saying so cont contemplating is not even you know you can't contemplate your way to the source of contemplation or yeah anyway that's so. an awesome great question and I, my answer my suggestion is exactly that is it what is exactly meant by right contemplation or correct contemplation which is what Connie said, that one, that's the right way. The wrong, the wrong way to contemplate things is discriminatory, discerned, lakshana-based discrimination thought. That's wrong contemplation. That's the wrong way to go about this. The right way is the non-way. The non, and so Connie, you were totally on the right track in that sense that it's like the right way to do this is the wrong way to do this. <laughs> or that type of idea. It's like, I was trying to be a little paradoxically funny there, but the idea is that the normal way to think about things and think about whatever, yeah, yeah, we're not talking about that. That's why the Buddha called it samyak or correct or proper. Mm -hmm. So, great. Once again, great insight. Any other questions, ideas, or comments about uh, any of these so far? So then, this is the the next one is like, yeah. I mean, they keep getting crazier, but the next one. Oh, by the way, oh, we're past time. Holy moly! How does that happen? Talk about neither existing nor non-existing. My gosh. Well, that's where we're going to just have to leave it here. Um, we didn't even get through Manjushri's first paragraph. That's okay. I think next Sunday we're going to pick back up with this very, this is, it's probably a great place to start, which is that the Tathagata should be contemplated as neither existing nor not existing. That's where we're going to start next time. So the Buddha doesn't exist, but he doesn't not exist. Hmm. That'll definitely be a good place to start next time. Any last questions, comments, ideas while we have just a, a moment? All right. Well, then I'll take this moment to say that uh, it's, it's great to be with you all as usual. Great to be here. Um, I hope you can turn, tune in again next Sunday for part two of the Manjushri's Pranipara Sutra. Um, and like I said, this is probably going to be going on for a while. 
because this is just a perfect sutra, we're talking about this idea of transcendent wisdom. So we'll do that. And with that, I'll probably pass it over to Gnome for a little bit.